Okay, so today I'm going to talk about um, adding a GraphQL API uh, into Python applications. Uh, so first of all, thanks for attending my presentation. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's my first time in Israel and in Tel Aviv. And I am really excited that you have this great conference uh, in here. So yeah, that's really cool. So let me introduce myself. Um, uh, I'm Marcin Gembala and I'm, uh, I come from uh, Wrocław in Poland. I work for Mirumi Software as a Python developer uh, for like six years or something like that. And for the last two years, I've been also working as a lead developer at a project called Sailor. Um, and at that project, I'm responsible uh, for building and maintaining a GraphQL API. And I'm also managing the open source community of that project. So, uh, to give you some context about what we are doing. So, this is basically our uh, platform. This is Sailor. That's the project that I've been working on for the last two years. So, basically, this is an e-commerce platform. So, if you know, uh, I don't know, WooCommerce or Magento or Shopify, this is something like that, but written entirely in Python. Uh, it's 100% open source. So you can get it for free from GitHub. And once you get it, what you will see, and when you run it, you'll see these two uh, front-end apps. This uh, on the left is the management dashboard for um, staff. And on the right, this is the storefront app. And both of these are, are built as single page apps right now. So we basically have a Django backend, GraphQL API on top of that, and these two are single page apps. So the thing is that we used to have a typical Django architecture in the past, but basically we wanted to improve user experience and you know use the newest tools that are available in JS, such as React. Uh, like this is how we want to build our user interfaces, and for that we needed an API. So uh, and we never had any REST API before, so we've picked GraphQL uh, from the beginning. Uh, so also uh, quickly about the API itself. So we have uh, 50 queries and 150 mutations right now. So it's fairly lar large API. Uh, we have features such as pagination, uh, filtering, sorting, and search capabilities, uh, JSON Web Token authentication, and permissions management. We also have database queries optimization. I'll talk about it later also. And there is also a public demo. So if you are using laptops and you want to see it, uh, how it looks like or play with it, um, if you go to demo.getsailor.com slash GraphQL, the API is available there. So you can just play with it. Uh, it's read only. Uh, all of the operations are like you can see what operations are there. You can fetch some example data and play with it. OK, so to, I think it will be uh, good to just uh, talk a little bit about the basic concepts of GraphQL. So maybe let me ask you, how many of you is using GraphQL or have ever used GraphQL? OK. Yeah. Not so many. Yeah, so yeah, let's, let's go through some of the basic stuff. So GraphQL basically is a data query language. Uh, it was built by Facebook in 2012, I believe. Uh, it was open source in 2015, and right now it's managed by uh, foundation, so it's fully open source initiative. Uh, and it was built as an alternative to REST, so um, in order to minimize amounts of data transferred. So in REST, we can have data overfetching when we are getting too much data from the server, because it's the server that defines what data to return for a particular endpoint. And we can also have data underfetching when we have to uh, combine multiple requests in front end to render one page, for example. And another, another goal of GraphQL uh, creators was to increase developer productivity. So we have basically three types of operations in GraphQL. Uh, we have queries for fetching data. We have mutations for modifying data on the server. And we also have subscriptions, uh, which is the way to exchange data in real time over WebSockets. And what is also important, uh, and that's uh, one of the main differences with REST as well, is that all operations, uh, like queries and mutations, are sent as POST requests. And there is only one endpoint in GraphQL. So there is only slash GraphQL. And you send, send all of the queries or mutations to that endpoint. So, so that's a uh, like significant difference between uh, REST, for example. And in GraphQL, uh, we have schema. 
So this is actually the core part of API. And this basically defines what data and like what, what data is available in our API and how this data looks like. So um, this is you can think of schema as a contract between um, backend and frontend also. Um, so as you can see in this example, um, that's a very simple example taken like uh, inspired by our API. So we have two types. We have type user to represent our users. So that would be a resource in our REST API. Uh, and we have some fields um, to represent uh, the user model. Uh, some of these types, as you can see, every field has its type. So uh, some of these types are built in GraphQL, such as string, ID, booleans, uh, boolean, and float, so the simple ones. But uh, we can create our own types like this one, like type user. We also have type address or type image. So you can, we can create uh, like all types that we want. Um, yeah, so, so this is schema. And schema also defines the operations. So we have type query. This is kind of special type. We also have type mutation. And in here, we define what queries would be available in our API. So we would have a product uh, query that takes some ID and returns a product, for example. Uh, what is also very nice about schema is that if we have our whole the definition of our whole API in one file, it's very easy to track changes. So for example, if our team is working on new feature or modify something in the schema, for example, one field became, becomes required or not. Uh, by the way, exclamation mark at the end means that this field is required and uh, cannot be null, for example. So it's very easy to see later, for example, when you're doing review, which field actually changed and why. So it's very easy to track what's going on with the API. So let's take a look at queries. Um, a query uh, in GraphQL might look like this. So in this case, um, yeah, so it starts with the keyword query. And then we have the so-called selection set. So these are the fields that we want to get from the server. In this case, we want to get a product of this ID. And for this product, we want to get some uh, fields. So this is how GraphQL syntax lo looks like. And a response might look like this. So this is basically JSON. And um, one important thing is that um, we have exactly the same fields in the response as in the query. So uh, that's another um, very important feature of GraphQL that we are getting only the data that we've requested. And it is the client that defines what data to get. So not the server, but the client. And similarly, mutations. Um, this looks um, almost identical, except the li list of arguments is a bit more complex. So in this case, uh, we have keyword mutation. Then we have the name of the operation. So in our case, that could be, for example, customer update. So we want to modify data of some user. Then we provide the ID of the user and some input data that we want to actually pass to that operation. And then we define uh, what we want to get back. So in this case, we want to get back uh, the user type. And for that user, we want to get the new email. And a response for that might look like this one. So basically, uh, whole API consists of these queries and mutations. So they look like this. And how do we build something like that in Python? So if you now, or maybe, now you would get more results, but one uh, year ago, at least, um, if you Googled for Python and GraphQL, you would mostly get only uh, one um, result, and that would be Graphene framework. So that's the oldest, let's say, framework for GraphQL in Python. Um, it's the most popular one. So it has bindings for various web frameworks, such as Django or Flask. Um, you can use it also standalone, like without any web framework. And in Graphene, we build schema uh, with uh, classes like this. So you, you don't have to analyze this whole example, but basically um, we have um, object type. Then we define in a declarative manner, manner fields that we want to have in that type. Uh, and for every field, we need to write a resolver function. So these three functions are resolvers. Um, so if you look at the function name, so if we have a uh, user field, then we also have resolve user function. So basically this function, functions tell the API how to get data for um, these particular fields. 
So this is quite um, convenient to use, also quite powerful because uh, resolvers allow you to use any um, like data source. So in our case, this is only Postgres database, but if you had multiple databases or you could even ask for data from other APIs and that's very easy to do in GraphQL. Um, right, so that's uh, how it looks like. That's, that's the basics. So um, we've picked Graphene like about two years ago and started playing with that. And it's a good framework, but it has some problems. Um, and it was very difficult for us to um, build like this fully fleshed API. Uh, because it was very difficult to find some resources about that, and we had to invent some of our of, of the patterns that we use ourselves. And um, in this section, I, I'd like to show you some of the recipes that we've invented to solve some of the common issues that um, we might we may have in web development. So, I'd like to start with the project structure because that's in, if you know if project is simple and you are start, starting to play with a framework, it's very easy, you know. You put everything into one file at the beginning, then you start split, splitting it up. But if you have existing project and you want to build API pretty quickly, let's say in, in a few months, and the project is fairly big, uh, the project structure is important. As I said, we had Django application, and if you are familiar with Django, uh, there is the concept of apps in Django, so every app is just a module uh, with a model, definition, view definition, um, Python business logic. So uh, we use apps to enclose common functionality. And we decided to put our whole API into sing single directory GraphQL. And we basically mirrored the structure of our Django apps inside uh, GraphQL directory. So we ended up with modules like account. So with Django, we had account app. Then we also have the account module in GraphQL. Uh, so we have modules like this. We also have api.py file, uh, which basically gathers data from all of these modules and exposes that um, to a uh, slash GraphQL view. And single module looks like this. So we have a few files, but uh, the most important are these four, four files. So we have types.py, which contains definition of all um, types, so these classes that you've seen these object type classes. Then we have resolvers.py to keep all of the functions um, that define um, how to get data. So we basically use Django ORM to get data from database, but if we have to do some pre-processing, post-processing, filtering, sorting, etc., uh, we keep that in resolvers uh, in this file. And then we have mutations.py uh, for all the mutation definitions. And lastly, we have schema.py it's again to gather all of the types, resolvers, and mutation, and expose that uh, outside. So if you are building a web API, you probably want to have some authentication. And GraphQL doesn't tell anything about authentication. So it's up to us how we want to approach that. So we decided to use JSON Web Tokens. That's quite a common pattern in REST APIs. Uh, where you uh, send a token, so user have to provide his credentials. If they are valid, we create a token. And you can use this token later to authenticate subsequent requests. And you include that, this token as a header. So what can you do in Graphene? So by default, there is no implementation, no support for that. But there is this library, Django GraphQL JWT. And this library gives you this mutation, so it's simply token create mutation, and it does exactly um, what I said before. So it takes uh, credentials, and basically it re returns the token in the default version. We've extended the mutation a little bit to add uh, some user data, because usually in single page app, you want to uh, instantly render some user states, such as user's avatar, email, uh, or first name, last name. And yeah, and that's that. That's the response for, for this mutation. So we are getting the token that is later stored on the, in the client, in local storage, for example. Um, there is also mutation to uh, refresh the token because it has some, it's valid only for some, uh, some time. So we have to refresh it from time to time. And yeah, with this mutation, you can add uh, JSON web tokens to your API. 
Um, what this library also does is it gives you access to restrict permission to particular fields. So that's also not built in, in Graphene. So in Graphene, when you are building your types and you expose that, um, there is only one AB, uh, endpoint, sorry, and like users can see all of your types and they, they can basically access them. But if you want to limit access to particular fields, um, you could use decorators, uh, which are provided by this library. And if you are familiar with Django, these are very, it works very similarly. So in Django, we have the same decorators to, ac to limit access to views. In here, we can decorate either resolver functions, like on the example um, at, at the top. And then inside the decorator, we specify what permissions are required to access this resolver. Um, and similarly for, for mutations. So in mutations, we have the mutate function that's uh, part of graph Graphene API, and we can simply decorate it with one of these uh, resolvers. So it's fairly simple. Of, of course, users still can see your whole schema. That's one downside of, of this approach, but at least they cannot access all of the fields. That, that's one of the limitations of Graphene currently. Um, if you have a lot of mutations, um, and most of them are, like in our case, most of them are simply crude mutations. So we create uh, instances, delete, and update them. So if we have a lot of these mutations, we want to be able to um, have also unified error handling, and that's also something that we had to invent ourselves. So by default, a mutation in Graphene looks like this. It's not very beautiful, uh, like when you first look at it because it has these class arguments. Uh, it also can has class meta for some metadata. So it's not very readable at first, but what this uh, uh, piece of code does is, uh, first we have the class at product, that's the name of the mutation, then we have product um, field. So that's the response of the mutation. So that's one, what we can get back from the mutation. Then we have class arguments, that's input data. And Graphene's API is uh, this mutate function which where we define what should happen when this mutation is called. So in this very basic example, we just take the input data, pass it into a model, and save it. So, you know, that's not a real-world example, actually. And um, it would be really nice to have some data validation for incoming data, like in Django Forms, for example. Uh, it would be very nice to also maybe validate the instance that was created from this data. And if there are any errors during execution, we would like to return them in a unified manner. So again, GraphQL doesn't tell anything about error handling. So it's up to us, how do we include that in our API? So our approach was to include that in the schema because errors, like application errors, are valid state of our app, right? So if user do something wrong, it's still state of application that we have to handle. So our API has to return it. So we've created this uh, little tool uh, base mutation. And actually, this is the base class for all uh, mutations that we have in Graphene in our API. Um, so what it does is basically we've added um, another function to that API, which is called perform mutation at the bottom. And this function is called inside mutate. And as you can see, um, perform mutation is wrapped with try accept that catches all validation errors. And if there is any validation error, they are converted uh, to a unified errors list. And we have also this error type. So it's pretty simple, but it's, it works basically like uh, Django validation that we can do on models. So in Django, if we have a model, we can call model full clean, and it will return the validation errors. Uh, so by using these base mutations, we can only implement one function, perform mutation, focus on the, like, let's say, positive flow where everything works, and delegate error handling to some other parts of, of code, like to other utilities, and they can simply return raise validation error if anything goes wrong. And we don't have to care about it at the API level. So, um, yeah, it, it helps us to clear, clean the code a lot when we introduce that. So that's, uh, yeah, for error handling. And then we also have database queries optimization. So as I said, we are using Postgres database, so a relational one. 
and you may be familiar with the n plus one problem. So imagine this very simple case. We have um, two models. We have product model and each model product has a lot of Im like multiple images. But because we have some uh, metadata about images, we store them in um, database table. So for example, if we were to render a product list, we would use this query. Um, this is uh, product first is, is the pagination pattern for in GraphQL. So in this query, we are fetching only one product. But uh, what we want to get is the product name and a thumbnail. Because we want to render product list and we want just to show some image. Um, and thumbnail underneath uh, actually goes to the images table to fetch images, right? So if we are fetching only one product, we get two database hits because we have to get the product and we have to get the image. But if we have to fetch 20 products, for example, then we would get 21 database hits. So that's the n plus one problem. And that's a very basic example. But if you have a lot of relations and your data model is complex, then it becomes really problematic. So. Uh, and the problem is that, as I said before, one of the most powerful things about GraphQL is that it's the client that defines the query. So we, as a backend developers, never know what actually what combination of fields will be sent to the server. So it's not so easy to you know add some prefetching uh, to optimize it because we don't know what fields will will be in the query. But uh, fortunately for us, there is a library called Graphene Django Optimizer. Again, it's not part of Graphene, uh, but it's very helpful. And with this library, we were able to optimize our API. Um, so basically, what it does, it gives you this decorator. Um, and this decorator has this resolver hints function, where you can tell if, for example, we have resolved thumbnail uh, resolver. And with this decorator, you can tell this resolver what data to prefetch from other table uh, in, in order to resolve uh, this data. So once uh, Graphene analyzes the GraphQL tree, the query tree, it looks for these resolvers. And before it actually gets to the database, all of these prefetches are added. Django query sets are lazy. So once the uh, query set is ready, like we will get only two queries, for example, always when we are getting products and thumbnails in this case. OK. So. These were the few patterns that we've invented ourselves. So let's talk about some problems of, of Graphene Framework. So as you can, as you've probably noticed already, um, fully fledged API requires, requires additional third party libraries. So some of the things that seems like they should be part of the uh, framework are not uh, there. And we have to use these libraries. And it's, it's really nice that they are around. But the problem with them is that these are not very popular libraries, let's say. So we never know if they are, they are going to be maintained or not. So if you want to rely on, like, it's very difficult to add another third party library that you don't know if, you, if it will be maintained or not. So, you know, um, there is also no way to uh, calculate the query costs. So in GraphQL, because you can uh, send uh, very complex queries, like deeply nested, and uh, it may be, even with the optimizations, m a malicious user could send a query that would be very deeply nested and it would be very difficult to resolve uh, or would require a lot of resources. And there is no way to prevent that in Graphene yet. In other frameworks, there are ways to solve that. For example, in Apollo Server in JavaScript, there are ways to calculate basically how complex is the query and we can just add some limits on that. But I think, uh, I hope that that will be added into Graphene. It's, it's not very difficult to implement, actually. Um, yeah, but it's not part of the API yet, of, of framework. There is also, it's not possible to ser serve multiple schemas. So if you had one um, application and it was used by, by, for example, like in our case, we have private admin part and we have the public uh, customers part. So it's not possible to serve private and public schema from one URL. Um, and that's also a limitation of the framework. You cannot have um, two types, for example, in Graphene that um, are connected to the same database model. Um, yeah, so that's quite inconvenient. And because of that, we have to expose of our types 
we have the permission management, like uh, users cannot access some particular fields, but still we are exposing them, so that's not really uh, nice. And the biggest issue actually about the framework is maintenance uh, issue. So we had this talk, uh, the keynote today, about a uh, Guido leaving Python community. And um, like, um, yeah, so th the same actually happened in Graphene because um, the original creator of the framework actually stopped, stopped maintaining it. And there is a group of core developers who are trying to form some, some governance around the framework, but I don't know, it's, it's very difficult to see how it will go. There is no roadmap yet. Uh, it is very hard to find good learning resources. So when we started building the API, there was no examples of how to, you know, solve some of the issues that we had. So we had to invent all of them, of like a lot of these things ourselves. Also, the documentation is a bit inconsistent, and you also have to go to the source code to understand what's going on in the framework. And unfortunately, when you go to the source code, you will find a lot of weird stuff inside, like promises which are, of course, not the way that we handle asynchronous stuff in Python. I think that because Graphene was heavily inspired by JavaScript, because GraphQL was first inspired in JavaScript, and that's the reason for, for them to add promises. Okay, so that brings us to an end, and let's try to summarize this thing. So, still, GraphQL is the great tool for data exchange between backend and frontend, and if you have single page application on your front end and you're building API, I really recommend checking out GraphQL because it unlocks really powerful to tooling. But I think there is no much difference for backend developers. Like, we have to write REST APIs, we have to write resolvers in GraphQL. It really doesn't matter, for, at least I think so. But the most benefits are on the front end. Um, they have, for example, tools like type generation. So if we have types in our API, they can generate TypeScript types out of it. So any any time we change something in the API, we run one tool and all of the types in front end are updated. So this is really powerful full and speeds up the development of, of single page. Uh, Graphene is the most developed GraphQL framework currently. Um, despite some limitations, it allows you to build powerful APIs. But the future of the framework is uncertain. Uh, fortunately, new libraries are emerging so the whole ecosystem for GraphQL in Python is just forming. So it's like pretty new stuff in Python. And Graphene was the first try to, to, to implement something uh, to, to handle that. And yeah, but there are new libraries. Um, there is this one, for example, uh, which is called Ariadne. Uh, you can check it out. Uh, it uses a little bit different approach. It's schema first approach where you first write schema and then you build um, and then you write resolvers for that. It was inspired by Apollo server. And lastly, I've prepared a bunch of resources for you to check out. So um, the first four are links to the Graphene ecosystem and some libraries that we use that may be helpful. And then you have three other GraphQL libraries in Python. And lastly, there are links to uh, our project. So if you want to check out how a fairly la large GraphQL Graphene code base looks like, uh, you can check out Miromi slash Sailor. Uh, that would help me a lot a year ago when we were building our API and we were looking for some examples. And that's it. Thanks for listening.